Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show as we are doing um, today, um, and um, so you can watch it later um, at your convenience, and I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of our show recordings. Both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch, so please do share. Uh, with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, uh, anyone you think might be interested in um, any of the topics we have in Encompass Live. Uh, for those of you not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries, so we're we similar to your state library. So we provide services and resources to all types of libraries in the state, so you will find shows on Encompass Live for all types of libraries, uh, public, academic, K-12, um, corrections, museums, archives, um, really anything and everything. Our only criteria is that it's something to do with libraries. We do book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, dem demos of services and products, all sorts of things. Um, we have uh, Nebraska Library Commission staff that sometimes come on the show and do presentations about things, we um, services and, and resources and things we're offering here through the Library Commission. Uh, but we also bring on guest speakers sometime, as that is what we have today. Um, we have with us uh, Lacey Rogers, who is from our University of Nebraska Omaha campus. Um, the Chris. Hello. Lovely. She's got a good morning. Good morning, Lacey. How are you doing? Good. Good. Thank you. All right. And she's going to talk to us about so deploying soft skills in the library setting. Um, and this is a yes. session that she did uh, in May. Back in May, yes. Um, one of our regional library systems, Southeast Library System, system does an annual um, training extravaganza, is what they call it. <laughs> and uh, this was um, at that present that um, event, um, but that was an in-person session. So um, I invited her to come on here and on Compass Live, so we could have a nice recorded one and um, have it available to even more people who weren't able to attend just our one little show here, our one little event here in Nebraska. <laughs> Um, so I'll hand it over to you, Lacey, to go ahead and tell us a little about how to do this. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, as Krista said, this is going to be about deploying soft skills in the library setting. I'll introduce myself just a little bit. My name is Lacey Rogers. I am the Access Services Librarian at the University of Nebraska Omaha. I've been in Access Services and Libraries for about 15 or so years, and I've worked in customer service in some shape or form since I was like 13 and started working at a Dairy Queen in my hometown. So I, I know a little bit about customer service. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> All righty. So what are soft skills? Um, I have seven key skills listed on this side of my presentation here. Communication, customer service, teamwork, problem solving, self-motivation, flexibility, and time management. Um, my presentation is going to focus on the top three with communication, customer service, and teamwork. Um, but I'll go through each one a little bit before we move too far forward. On the other side of the presentation, the, I have some job postings that I found just randomly on Indeed for local library positions. And you can see in here some of the things that they have listed. All three of them have some sort of customer service, excellent customer service skills, um, strong customer service skills, uh, high, excellent communication skills, uh, important on all of those playing as part of a team teamwork time management is necessary the ability to build a rapport with students is necessary um, there's a lot of different ways to list a lot of these things in job ads um, communications my very favorite one when i was looking these up back in may there was uh, an ad for a dental assistant and it listed that you needed to have enthusiastic communication skills and i'm thinking how does that work in a dental office to be enthusiastic? Well, I'm so glad you're here today and we have some wonderful news for you. You have to have a crown and it's gonna cost you $1,500. I'm enthusiastically telling you that. And that's, that seems like a very difficult thing to do. But that's, that's okay. Um, customer service is gonna be in almost every single ad because there are so, so many ads for service related jobs. And 
I think sometimes it's forgotten that libraries are service related, probably not among librarians and library assistants, but I think a lot of folks out there still think of libraries as shh, and that's not at all what we are really anymore. Um, I, I'm pretty sure I get shushed more than anybody else in my library, but that's that's another another step. Um, same thing with teamwork. There's a ton of ways to list that. This one on the bottom says, you know, an ability to build a rapport with students. Um, I've seen, you know, ability to work in a collaborative way, collegiality, ability to maintain relationships. That's a big one in uh, sales, but it's important in academia too because you're building relationships with students. Um, facilitating connections, so on and so forth. There's going to be a lot of fancy ways to say you need to have good service skills. Um, problem solving. I'm, that's not going to be one I, I talk about a lot today, but it is an important one because that can be anything from unjamming the printers, which I am the queen of doing this, all the way up to being able to diffuse a tense situation, which is a little bit different in libraries. Hopefully nobody has had anything so tense that it, it borders into like emergency management services, but it, it, it could be, you know, somebody is very, very upset and yelling at you and you're in a library. And even if you're not a sh library, you still need to make sure people aren't screaming at you. Um, Innovation, creativity, dedication, all of these things are going to fall under self-motivation. One thing that I think is important to look for, make sure that you're not asking somebody to over-dedicate because that can lead to burnout. Burnout is a very hot topic and we could probably do an entire presentation on that, but that's not what we're here for today. Um, flexibility. This is one thing that I'm really good at. I Fortunately, don't have a lot of outside commitment. So if somebody needs me to come in on a weekend, yeah, cool. That's awesome. That's not for everybody. Um, you know, folks have families. They can't be flexible with their kids' school. They can't be flexible because they're caring for a parent or a sibling. Uh, they have doctor's appointments they need to go to. Some folks just flat out don't want to be flexible. It is what it is. And some folks feel like they're entitled to others being flexible because of some of their outside obligations. Something that communication skills will come in handy with. Um, personally, I'm a, a fan of rewarding flexibility. Hey, you came in for me this morning at 7 a.m. Let's figure out a way to make sure you can come in later, uh, later in the week. Time management. I'm going to skip this one because I have to be honest, time management is not a thing that I've ever been good at. Time is not <laughs> a skill that I can grasp, unfortunately. So communication, this is a big one. And this is one that I feel like I can talk about. What is the best way to communicate? I found that the best way to communicate with folks is to ask how they feel is the best way for them to communicate. Um, if you know something basic like hey how what's the best way to contact you in case of a snow day and the building is closed some folks are going to say hey text me some folks are going to say wow i'd really appreciate a phone call you're going to have other people while i'm on email most of the time i haven't personally come across it but i know that some younger folks um hey can you can you message me on social media that's maybe not my favorite way to do things because i'm not on a lot of social media but if, if that's the way that you know works out best okay well these are the social medias that i'm on are you on either of these can i message you on instagram say hey we're closed so if being being upfront with people hey what's what's the easiest way for you to communicate there definitely has to be some give and take in there because of like social media being kind of a blurry one um but i mean that's the best thing to do with communication is to ask and that's like you know starting with the basics like i said going all the way up to how do you best respond to constructive criticism? What should I be expecting with this? I personally am usually fairly responsive to constructive criticism, but I also need to let it sit in a little bit. So I would wanna answer this question with, you can tell me the constructive criticism, please don't expect me to respond right away because I want some time to think about it so I don't say the wrong thing. And that way I also have a plan to figure out when I communicate back to you, I have a plan on how we're going to go forward with the constructive criticism. I can say, these are the things that I've thought about. These are the ways that I want to try and fix this. Yeah, and it's um, hard sometimes too when, and, and some some people have 
communication difficulties, um, getting blindsided by something that you didn't know was a problem. Yes. And you can't really be expected to respond immediately when you had never heard that anything was happening. <laughs> and yes. Know, um, okay, thank you for that. Um, let's, let me, you know, talk through it and think about it and we'll get back to you. I can tell you what I think right now, but let's not finish this conversation right now because right. That's, you know, you've had time to think about this a lot, obviously, because you just have brought it to me, but I didn't know anything, possibly, possibly didn't know it was happening, even, you know. Anything. Yes, and I mean, on either side of that, I don't want to have somebody explode and what do you mean I'm not doing this correctly? If that's, if somebody knows that's how they respond, then we definitely want to say, I need to be given constructive criticism away from any kind of front desk situation. Yes. Definitely needs to be in an office or perhaps a classroom if that's something that's available. Just so just so people aren't concerned about, wait, why is this employee screaming at the employer, employer vice versa? Keep that private. <laughs> Keep it private. Yes, that's always, even if it's somebody that accepts constructive criticism, well, it's, it's best to be in, in a private situation just in case um, you have somebody that overhears something and then there's the gossip mill that starts. We don't want that. Um, so what's the difference between a formal and informal communication? Um, social media, we'll go back to that. That's a great example. When you're posting on Facebook, are you posting as a library associate or are you posting as yourself? Um, I always take into consideration when I post something on Facebook, I'm always kind of representing my employer. I don't have anything listed about where I work on my social media, but I'm also pretty easy to find. If you wanted to Google Lacey Rogers, Omaha, Nebraska, my profile at UNO is going to pop up and there it is. Somebody could easily contact my employer and say, hey, did you know that your employee is posting weird things about her dog <laughs> on social media? That's usually the only thing I do post on social media. So if somebody's offended by something I posted about my dogs, they can, uh, they can go ahead and contact my employer. That's fine. Um, but yeah, that would, conversation. <laughs> that would be a great conversation. It would probably be a long conversation because my employer, my current supervisor also has dogs and they would just be like, so what's going on with the dogs? <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> I digress. Um, so social media generally is generally an informal way to communicate. So if you do have somebody, that's how they prefer to be told that the building is closed. Still needs to be a little bit professional. Hi, employee X, just to let you know, there's a snow day. You don't have to come to work today. Thanks, bye. But informal can get too informal. When you send an email to a supervisor, you don't want to be like, hey, bro, what's up? I'm not going to be in tomorrow. Is that cool? You still need to have the level of professional in there, even if you do consider yourself to have a pretty friendly relationship with your coworkers or supervisors. Um, hi, Supervisor A. I need to let you know that I have a really terrible headache and I'm going to the doctor tomorrow so I don't think I'm going to make it in I'm sorry for the inconvenience thank you employee x it's there's just that level of you're at a job and you need to make sure that you can regardless of whether it's a text message an email it still needs to have that level of professionality to it so that they know that this is a work thing and not hey can you well, hey, can you wash my dogs for me? That's what's saying. It's gonna come back to that all the time, sorry. Um, and it's really important to think about what your conversations are at work that aren't necessarily work-related. Um, yes, you can already tell, I talk about my dogs all the time. I love them, they're adorable. I show pictures, so on and so forth. But I've also been in situations where I've been really comfortable with my coworkers and all of a sudden we're talking about like body hair and we're comfortable talking to each other about this, but we don't necessarily know that the people coming to the desk are comfortable with this or that any other employee that can be listening outside of this small group is comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. So you need to be careful with that, which is a good lead into being able to respect reasonable boundaries and setting reasonable boundaries. Um, if somebody needs to bow out of a conversation, it might be worth your time to check back and say, hey, was this just a timing thing and you needed to leave or were we being offensive? Um, that's fine. Can you tell employees, you know, my building is open from 7 a.m. until midnight. 
I generally set my quiet hours on my phone from midnight to 7 a.m. So you can't text me. I'm not going to see that you emailed me. Maybe that needs to be different for other folks. You know, if your building is open from nine to nine and you have people coming in at eight, don't, you know, don't email me after 930. I'm not going to be paying attention to it because it's outside of my working hours. Um, if it's an emergency, that's a little bit different. And for me, I found that the best practice with communication is the more you communicate about how you communicate, the better your communication is going to be. If you're open about communication, if you're willing to take the feedback, constructive criticism, even if it's something simple like, hey, I feel like you talk too much. That's true. I'll work on it. Thank you. Um, yeah, just making sure being open, being honest, being able to ask questions and find an appropriate way to answer those questions are all important parts of communication. Customer service. Like I said, I've been doing this since I was like 13. Um, I'm 38, so I think that's 25. We'll not talk about that, that's fine. Um, so some of the things that customer service, I know that nobody likes to hear it, Policies, policies. We write policies for a reason, even if it's something very, very small, like we are not able to print more than two pages for a patron having issues. Um, as, as interesting as it would be, there is no way to train for every single customer service transaction. If you were to write a policy for every single thing that could happen in a library, you would never be done training and the person would never be at the desk because they would just be reading and reading and reading and reading. Sometimes things just have to happen as they are, but that's why we have policies. If they're clear, if they're simple, we can refer patrons to those policies. Yes, I understand that you're having some technical difficulties getting your 50 page brochure printed off. Unfortunately, it's our policy that we can only make two copies for folks free of charge. If you'd like, I can do those two copies and you can come back later to see if we have time to help you with the technical issues. Um, I, I understand that you have a classroom of students, but unfortunately it's our policy that one person can only check out 25 items at a time. You have 50, we really can't break that policy. I'm so sorry. Um, our policy is the building closes at nine. It's now 9.02. You need to leave. If you're not willing to leave, I will have to call the appropriate authorities. For me, that's campus security. I worked in public libraries. At that point, it was actual city police. Um, if you're fighting in my building, we have a policy against that. No violence. Call the police. I had to call the police and campus security more than I would like, but that's what the policies are there for. Some things are a little bit out of our hands as librarians. I personally don't want to jump in and break up a fist fight. I have a current staff member that would be happy to do that, but that's not me and it, it really shouldn't be that staff member either. They should probably not be volunteering to break up fist fights. But yes, you have to have those policies in place and you need to make sure that you can follow them. Uh, wait a minute, you told them what? Wait, you told them what? I get this a lot. We're a very open place. We try to really help our patrons out, but sometimes, sometimes, the answers aren't always super clear. So I have a little story here that I wanna, that I wanna share with this. This is back in my public library days. Um, we had a patron call in. I was in the back, uh, another associate had answered the phone, patron called in, and I can only hear the one side of the conversation, but um, I hear the associate answer the phone, patron says something and the associate says, no, we don't have baskets to check out, we don't, we don't do that kind of stuff. Do you do you need a place? I, you know, if you need baskets, you can go to the Dollar Tree or to Walmart. And patron says something else. And I hear the associate say, no, we don't check out baskets. I don't know what you're talking about. And that's kind of the end of it. And they hang up and they kind of roll their eyes and they say, why would anybody want to check out a basket? And it hits me. Did they say they wanted to check out a basket or did they say they wanted to check out baskets? That's a TV show. It had Zach uh, Galifianakis in it. It was actually really funny. 
we could have ordered that TV series in for them easily. It would have taken us three minutes to get this situated and maybe two weeks to get it from Amazon in. But the associate didn't understand and wasn't really willing to understand. So what do you mean you told them we can't check out baskets? No, we don't have that DVD series here, but we can get it. And as far as baskets for their home, I think they know that <laughs> they can't go to the library to check out baskets. When you get a question like that, that is obviously seems really weird. That's where uh, doing the, your reference interview skills would come into play. Like, well, yes. let me figure out what you're really trying to say. Yes. This for. yes, that I will never forget that phone call because I always think, you know, if I would have answered that first things first, if I would have answered that, it probably would have been a 20 minute phone call because I'd have been like, I love that show. <laughs> I would have talked about scenes from the show. But the, at that point, if I would have answered it, we also would have gotten the patron what they needed everything would have worked out. Um, hopefully that person, I don't work at that library anymore, but hopefully that person was able to get a hold of something so they could watch what they needed. Um, picking your battles, knowing when to end the fight, that's also a big part of customer service. It, it doesn't always seem like it, but it is. Um, it goes back to those policies and it goes back to keywords. Is, is the patron making a threat and how do you know when it needs to be taken seriously? If a patron is grumpy about a fine and they say they're going to take it to the next level, the library director, maybe even beyond that, they're going to take it to the city manager. If it's a public library, they're going to take it to, um, I had somebody threaten to take something to the Board of Regents one time as an academic librarian. How how serious is that? And is that an automatic pass to say, OK, we'll take care of the fines? Well, that's going to go back to your policies. Do you have a policy saying, you know, first time you lose an item, we will waive it. Anything after that, you have to pay for it. I'm very sorry, but this is our policy. Not even the city manager or the mayor or the governor can change this. So sorry. Um, what's the cost? to replace or repair the item? Is it something that you can eat? You know, if somebody comes in, they're constantly losing $5 paperbacks, it adds up, but maybe it's okay to break that policy and say, okay, I know you've already lost six of these, but you've paid for five of them. We'll go ahead and, you know, wave the seventh, buy five, get the six free, that kind of a thing. Um, we check out some higher level technology at the library I'm currently at. So we can't really afford to let a pass go when somebody brings in um, a Canon T7 DSLR camera and says, hey, um, I didn't mean to, but this got tossed out the back seat of back seat window of my car and it's shattered. Sorry. Yeah, I'm really sorry too, because now you owe me $500 and I'm, you can take that to whoever you want, but you destroyed it. You signed paperwork saying that you would take care of it. And I, I can't let that slide. Um, I've had some folks, you know, make valid arguments about what has happened to the technology. Yeah, I'm really sorry you're in that situation. Unfortunately, it's a high dollar item and you signed the paperwork. You have to pay that $500. Yeah, um, if somebody comes in place for that reason. Yep. So exactly. That that's why we have that paperwork. Um, you know, if somebody loses a a lens cover for a camera. Okay, that's a little bit different. We can order those in bulk on Amazon for like $4 a piece. Um, this is the first time you've ever had an issue when you check these cameras out weekly. We're gonna let those that lens cap pass. However, if it's somebody that loses a piece of the camera every time they check it out, I'm so sorry, but this is a habitual thing. Our policy states that you need to replace it. You did sign the paperwork. It's $4, you can pay it next time you come in. Um, and this last part about maybe there is someone for everyone. I, I've had some interesting relationships with patrons. I think everybody can say that, but I had a difficult patron at a former job. Um, they were well known for having meltdowns when folks didn't understand them and they, there were a lot of ways that you could misunderstand this person. They didn't always have the correct words for what they wanted. They didn't always have a, a constant stream of thoughts to communicate out what they wanted. Um, they lost their words a lot. They 
mumbled a lot. They were sometimes hard to understand. So it was easy for them to kind of get lost in it and get frustrated and have a meltdown. Um, so this patron started asking for a specific associate and I was like, okay, we'll see how this works. Um, started taking them back to this specific associate and I later asked this person, I said, are you, are you okay with this person always asking for you? Did you tell them to do this? And they said, yeah, it's fine. I think I just get them. Hmm. That's amazing. I'm very glad you're here because I don't get this patron and I have a hard time and I'm so glad that there's somebody that can. And I think it's interesting how that works. There have been times where I have been in a position, somebody has been awkward for uh, lack of a better word. They can be a little bit difficult to understand. And for some reason, I just click with them and I can help them. It can be, that can happen for anybody. I haven't, knock on fake wood, I haven't run into a patron that is absolutely un helpable. Usually there's somebody somewhere that we can get help with. Occasionally that does mean the person that helps them is campus security or a police officer. Um, I did have one situation where a patron came in. Um, they were trying to sign up for a credit card and they needed to use our phone to do so and it was very awkward. Um, and yes, the, the person that ended up helping them was um, a police officer, but I didn't find that out until later when I saw a police officer escorting them out of a local grocery store. So that was an interesting one, but they got the help that they needed. Um, just not, just not for me. Teamwork. Teamwork makes the dream work. Um, that's a motto that I tell everybody to the point where it gets annoying. Um, <laughs> If you're not actively part of the team, nobody will want to be on your team. So it's best to lead by example. For me in a supervisor position, I, nobody wants to, if, if nobody wants to be at the desk and I'm out there, they're going to say, see that and say, okay, if my supervisor is doing this stuff that I don't really like, maybe I can do that too. So if you're leading by example, you're going to show that teamwork is important. Hopefully have a more cohesive team. Um, playing to everyone's strengths is something that has always worked well for me. If somebody actively dislikes an area, maybe don't schedule them there. I know that that can be a difficult thing to grasp, grasp sometimes. Um, I know every job that I've had, someone really, really dislikes working in youth services, story time type areas. Mm -hmm. And you know, if we're really short staffed and they have to be back there, sorry, you have to be back there. But in general, if you really don't want to be in youth services, I'm not going to schedule you there because they don't like it. The kids back there aren't going to like that. You don't like it. It's not going to work for anybody. So maybe this person that doesn't like youth services is really, really great at building displays. Cool. Let's work on that. Hey, we need a display uh, for um band books month what what can you come up with if you can work on this and do four really amazing displays for the building you know you can work on that while you're back in kids if you have to be there you can work on that um instead of being in kids um maybe there needs to be a discussion about some job expectations hey you were hired for this you it was listed that you do need to work in this area sometimes if it absolutely can't work for you we need to talk about flexibility um if you have to schedule people in a computer lab but you have somebody that's not very technologically savvy maybe figure out okay it's not super busy when we first open from 9 to 11. this person can work in the computer lab from 9 to 11 and we'll figure out another place you know somebody that's really great with computers can work between 12 and 2 when we're busy when people are on their lunch breaks and need to come in and have things done quickly um another thing with playing to everyone's strengths is watching for the overachievers i personally love an overachiever because it makes my job a lot easier because they really want to get things done. They really want to be active. They really want to help. And then they're not helpful. Um, overachievers who offer help to others with their project pieces can be godsends, but 
people who take over a project really are not. Um, overachievers can get comfortable in their roles. They can assume that they have knowledge and that knowledge may or may not be correct. And that makes them less likely to ask questions. And in the library business, asking questions is our business, whether it's somebody coming up to ask us a question about research or even where the restroom is. Um, it's really easy for someone to get really comfortable. Wow, I'm doing a really good job. So I'm just going to keep doing a really good job. And I don't need to learn this extra thing because I already know it, even though that extra thing is changed and they need to change with it. Um, I love it when people help. I love it when people offer to help others with their teamwork. I love it when people say, hey, I see you have this 10 part project. Can I take part three for you to make it easy? Yes, please. Thank you. That's awesome. Um, and when that person does part three and then leaves it and then maybe that person comes back and says, hey, I need help with part seven. OK, I'm willing to help. But the overachiever that comes in and says, I'll help you with part three and then just does parts three through ten. Oof, that's a little too much. Um, they might get burned out. We talked about that a little bit earlier, but they they might. They might also just make things really tough. <laughs> so it's it's something to watch out for. And it's part of, you know, these are all interconnected. If somebody really needs to stay busy, that's a strength. And you can figure that out by giving them extra projects, but make sure that they're not taking over something that somebody else might be better at. And my surprise fourth um, skill, this is not one that was listed on my first slide, but empathy. Um, this has been a big keyword in my research as of late. Um, and I did think it was interesting when I was looking through some of the job ads, I found that yes, empathy is something that they were looking for in one. This is a really specific library position it's was someone they were wanting someone to come into the library and help with um not esl isn't quite right but a little bit of esl they were looking for someone to help adult learners do back to school earning their ged um learning some job skills that kind of stuff so they wanted somebody that was empathetic along with the excellent customer service and communication skills and this is kind of a difficult one because this is where part of my research comes in. Is empathy a teachable skill? Yes, but also no. Um, part of my research, I read a really great book um, by a clinical psychologist, Martha Stout. And in this book, um, The Sociopath Next Door, it states that up to 4% of the population is a sociopath. So no, you cannot teach those people empathy generally not the kind of person drawn towards library work. They tend to move more towards like higher level business corporate things where they can flex power. But you might hit somebody that know, yeah. maybe they're not a full on sociopath, but maybe they have some tendencies. And for those folks, no, it's, it's not teachable. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, Maybe. And something that's important for me as a supervisor, is it something that I can teach? Is it something that you can teach as a supervisor? Um, yeah, maybe. But that's that's really up for you to figure out. Um, I know that that is something in my particular setting where that's a feedback question that we get on reviews. You know, is does this person show empathy? Do you feel like this is a person you can talk to? Um, when you need time off for personal things, is this someone, you know, would your fellow coworkers, employees say that you are cold hearted? Would they say that you're a pushover? Um, those kinds of things. And for me, it's it's kind of a, a golden rule thing. I want to be treated with empathy, so I'm going to treat others with empathy. It's uh, there's some give and take with it, because, yes, sometimes people will take advantage of you. But I also feel like the folks that maybe aren't so forthcoming with their personal issues, if they see you as somebody that will have some empathy, they might be more likely to talk to you and say, hey, this is why I'm not doing my best at my job right now. I don't want to divulge too many, um, too many details, but I'm having some family things going on. I feel like you might understand, is it okay if I start coming in late for a little while? 
yeah, I think, you know, otherwise you've been really flexible. Otherwise you've been really helpful on the team. I think that folks will understand. You don't have to say anything. I'll just let people know that you're not going to be in until 10 instead of eight and we'll work it out. Um, can it be detrimental? Can it affect other skills? Yeah, big time. Um, somebody that's empathetic in my experience has is better at, communi at tuning into communication styles and they're more likely to be a good team player because they're listening to what their teammates are saying. Um, that's kind of going back to some of that, uh, some of the parts with the teamwork. If somebody is really not enjoying this part, find somebody that can. If somebody has that empathetic value, they're going to notice that their teammate is not really grasping how to build this particular display and they're going to come in and help. They might not take it over from them, but they're going to say, hey, I have a little bit of expertise here. Can I help? Um, I see that you're struggling with this thing that you're usually really good at. Can I help? Um, does this need to be spread out across the team? And something that can be detrimental being that pushover. Yeah, overly empathetic folks often can be seen as somebody that can be walked on uh, while the non-empathetic folks are the ones that seem unapproachable. So there's needs to be that happy medium of, mm. am I somebody that people can talk to? Am I somebody that people want to talk to? And I, am I somebody that is saying yes? Not only can you talk to me and ask questions, but I wanna do the same with you. And it, you know, kind of going back to the communication, how do you want to be communicated with? How much empathy do I need to, to use with this particular employee? Um, if they personally are very hard and don't want to talk about it, it's personal things, I'm not going to go ask them, hey, how's your family life going? But if I have somebody that's, you know, kind of in that happy medium and they seem to be struggling, I can reach out, you know, mm -hmm. privately and say, hey, you seem to be struggling. Is there anything I can do to help? Even if that's all I ask and they say no, okay, they know that I'm willing to help, but that might be the one thing that leads them to say, yes, the thing that I need help with is I have my mom moving in with me. She's not super well. We're really having to do some remodeling on our house and it's been very stressful. Okay, would it be helpful for you, you know, this position you can work from home some, would it be helpful for you to take a week to work from home so that you can keep an eye on things at your house? Oh my gosh, yes, that would be amazing. They come back after that week feeling a little bit better about their personal life so they can focus a little bit more on their work. Um, it's, a, it's a hard thing. It's a hard thing to teach. It's a hard thing to learn, but I think it's it's out there. And I think that I really think that empathy is probably number one for soft skills, just because if you can learn it, if you can teach it, if you can practice it, your team in general is going to be a happier, healthier team, and they're going to be more willing to talk to you. They're going to be more willing to do the work in general. It's just going to be a better situation. Um, that is the conclusion of my slides. Um, if there happens to be any questions or if any other things come up, I have I think about 15-ish minutes before we're done and I'm happy to answer questions. Absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah, go ahead and just leave your slides up there just in case we need to pop back to anything. Uh, yeah, if anybody has any questions, go ahead and um, type into the question section of your GoToWebinar interface. We can ask any questions you have. Um, I'll also mention while we're looking at the slides, the slides will also be available afterwards along with the recording. We always post those up as well. So you will be able to refer back to um, everything that Lacey had put into the slides as well today. All right, yeah. Uh, so um, yeah, get your questions in. We have plenty of time for that. Um, actually, it's like perfect timing. Yeah, about 15 minutes left as we usually go for. Uh, so this was great, yes. Um, Lacey, uh, a lot of you know, soft skills, you're talking about soft skills in the library setting, and I think a lot of um, people assuming we're talking about um, with our patrons, with the people who come into the library, our students or our people in the public library, but it's not just that, it's also staff, uh, and I think that's something that people don't realize that's the same, the same kind of customer service skills that you use to your, the people that are coming into your library, uh, can and should be used for your colleagues, um, whether it's your, you, know, you as a supervisor or just um, people at the same level as you. 
and I mean, that even goes, I, I am a supervisor of supervisors, but I also have supervisors. So, I mean, some of those go the same way. I need to be able to communicate with my supervisors. Um, they need to know the best way to communicate with me. And that's just going to make everybody's job a little bit easier. You know, if, if, if it's easier to come by my office and say, hey, do you have a minute? Usually I'm going to say yes, unless if I'm doing something like this or if my door is closed and it says I'm presenting. Shh. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Uh -huh. um, and I, I will, I, the, that empathy part, I think, yeah, it does cross over into all of these other soft skills. It's kind of interesting that, you know, when you said you did this research, these are the seven things that everyone says is soft skills. But... I mean, that kind of is part of all of these things, you know, how you communicate, how you solve problems, which would be working with other people on a team, um, being flexible. Like one of your examples of um, understanding someone's having a bad time at home and they need some flexibility in their in their work. Um, so I think that you know, that should be at, your, at the top of the list. So they need to do new research on this. Um, I know I've worked with, um, in various other places where people didn't have that and it was it was difficult um supervisors that are just cut and dry these are the rules i don't care that whatever happened to you you should have contacted me about this and, and reported it this way and you didn't so i don't care that this horrible thing happened in your life uh you 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 told me about it wrong you you didn't you know get in touch with me well you're talking about how what's the best way to communicate with mm -hmm. you and i have something happened you know I was ill and I couldn't so I had my husband call instead and he just called who he knew and told them hey this is the, what's happening she'll be in later we'll figure it out and instead the supervisor's like well that's not who you should have told it's okay yeah <laughs> you got the you got the word right you know empathy is definitely exactly I mean it's Living in Nebraska, there's always that little chance, especially in Omaha, there's always that chance that you're going to get somebody calling saying, I was in a car accident. It's icy out. I was in a car accident because it's Omaha and people drive crazy. But um, yeah, you never know. And that's if, if that's me, that's not my first place that I'm thinking of is to call my supervisor. I'm I'm thinking about do I need to call my I should probably gonna call my spouse because they're gonna be the person that's the most connected being that they also have ownership in this vehicle. But yeah, I, I'm gonna want to call them. Um I have uh I have students, you know, we we have student workers. They probably want to call their parents first, you know, oh, they might sure. be on their parents' insurance. Sorry, your insurance is gonna go up. Well, that's um, insurance is my first call, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's going to be in there too. There's a lot of others. <laughs> Is it bad enough that you're needing to call 911? That's definitely going to be your first call. Mm -hmm. And then eventually, oh, I'm supposed to be at work. Okay, hang on. <laughs> yeah, it's like fourth or fifth down the line. <laughs> um, someone does have questions. Um, yeah, get your questions typed in if you want to. Um, do you have any, like, you said you did a lot of research on this. Do you have any, like, resources for learning some of these, like, like, readings whatnot you know is there any places that you would recommend where people can find out more about how to do these things grab this book actually um the one that i referenced uh, martha stout the sociopath next door it was written in 2005 so at this point it is a little bit dated i don't know if there's been any updating to it but i think that's a good starting place if you're interested in learning about what that is as far as what sociopathy involves um one thing that i have used as a resource if you're if you look at mental health websites um in particular if there's something that you feel a little bit more connected to like you know maybe you maybe you yourself or a family member has a uh, generalized anxiety disorder or they have a, like bipolar personality disorder if there's something in there that you have a little bit of a connection with i would start with that find a website um, that looks like it's run by therapists counselors uh, mental health practitioners in general and look to see what their tips are for handling situations with this particular type of disorder because generally they have empathy built into them because you need it. That's where you're really gonna look to see it. You know, this is, this is how I have to handle this situation. And it's been helpful 
on a college campus, we have a lot of kids right now that have a lot of social anxiety. The kids that are coming to campus right now, they were in high school during COVID era. They did their freshman and sophomore, possibly their junior year online. They have no idea how to sit in a classroom at this point because it's been forgotten because they haven't been in a classroom for three years. Um, I think a good example with that for me personally, my niece, um, she just graduated. She's going to college in the, a week. <laughs> I think she's moving in on Saturday, but um, she did her entire sophomore year online and it actually worked out really well for her. Um, she's really self-motivated. She tends to do better in a, in an independent setting and her grades were already good, but they got a lot better once she was able to work for it on her own. So knowing that this person works better this way, she was actually able, fortunately, to go to her counselor, her academic counselor at the school and say, look at how much better this is working for me, by the way, because I can get my work done at my own pace. I've been able to work more and I have a bunch of money saved up to go to college. Can I keep doing this? And they said yes. So it worked out, you know, knowing what works for people is yeah. always the best policy. So, yeah. Um, people are learning that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is and learning styles that's a whole different presentation too yes <laughs> different learning styles and, and and teaching styles are yeah everyone's going to react to react to them differently and some some two students do um move into college and do very well and some don't <laughs> and it does not work for them but there's so many other options now that's that's great yeah uh, so it just says, thank you so much for mentioning how important empathy can be in all of our relationships. Yes. yes. These are definitely some of the skills you should, could, and should carry over into just any part of your life. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, we're, of course, because we're here librarians talking about this right now as we were focusing on. But um, yeah, use this everywhere. And, and I think, yeah, if you um, practice it, all the time, not just like constantly think, okay, I'm at work, so I've got to have communication, I've got to be in a team, and I got to be, no, just do it all the time, and it just become, mm -hmm. oh, habit's a word, but just like, it's, it's natural. Yeah, it'll start to be more natural, and yeah. with empathy, I think if, if you can find one thing that really helps you feel like you're being more empathetic, whether it's, you know, I feel like I could listen to folks more, and that would make me seem more empathetic practice that um, you don't have to worry about anything else pick that one thing i'm going to listen to people more i'm going to be more thoughtful about what people are saying we're going to process this in a more complete way i'm going to be a better listener start with that then you can bridge out from there um if you want you know if you want to be a better storyteller if you want to if you do want to if you're somebody that's comfortable sharing more personal experiences um, I tend to be very personal, personal experience oriented. I'm very much a storyteller. Um, practice telling stories. I'm not a good storyteller necessarily, but I, I enjoy it. <laughs> if they're relevant to the situation, it's okay. Yeah. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, one thing about um, the empathy and the that very last slide where you had something about um, oh, building a rapport with the students. Yes, that I think is important too, is just, you know, I mean, they typically, they are younger than those of us who are working in um, the university library or, you know, when you've got your teens or whatever coming into the public library. And it can seem um, possibly to them to be a little intimidating. I've got to go to this adult and ask these things and are they not welcoming? Um, I worked in a university library before I was here, um, back in New York, and, um, when I started there, there was a previous reference librarian, and it's just his style. He wore a three-piece suit to work every day, and he was at the main reference desk, and then we had a little side desk, and the students would avoid him and come over to the side desk where I was. They thought he was just too, and he was a good, he did his job well, but, oh, this must be the big guy. I can't ask this person in this three-piece suit, my silly college question and come over to anyone else who's working at the desk and I was like dude you gotta you gotta loosen up <laughs> yeah <laughs> they just don't want to talk to you and and that's not good um so you know that's that building rapport you've got to you know know who you are you know don't walk around in like jeans and a ripped t-shirt but you know find that happy medium of no i'm not the like president of the college but i am the the guy you can ask your question mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> and that's and there's those that's like those are those like um 
subconscious or, you know, yeah, the vibes you put out that you don't realize sometimes. Yes, and that's part of the reason, I mean, we love to have work study students because somebody else pays them to work here, but that's part of the reason that we like having the student workers is, you know, if, if you are somebody that does have that social anxiety, coming up to the desk, even though I'm not a three-piece suit kind of person, um, I am older, you can tell that I am the professional at the desk. Oh, I don't know, maybe she's gonna be mean. I don't know whether we wanna talk to her, but then I have a student there that looks like they're, you know, kind of doing their homework. Well, maybe their homework's like my homework and I'll ask their this question and they can go from there. Mm -hmm. So it's a nice icebreaker to have. Of the student work. Diversity. <laughs> Um, yeah, and we got some comments here saying, yes, people don't slow down enough to listen. Definitely. There's a lot of talking over, which I hate. You know, wait, just listen, let them say their thing. Yeah. Um, all right. And I'll also comment saying, thank you very much. Great, wait, great webinar. You're welcome. Glad. Hopefully it was useful. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, got a lot to learn. Yes. <laughs> um, hopefully this will. I do uh, research on it and I still have a lot to learn. <laughs> <laughs> I think this will get you started on it. Yeah. Um, all right, and so we got some more questions coming in here. Uh, realizing that people come to our profession with different levels of soft, soft skills, can you work, recommend ways to train staff? I think the biggest training tip that I have is that going back to ask about, ask how they prefer to be communicated with, ask what their preferences are. Mm -hmm. um, when you're in training and they're doing readings or they're watching videos or they're shadowing somebody, um, if you notice that they look really bored when they're shadowing, okay, this is something that is not working for them. Not the best way for them, yeah. Yeah, ask them, hey, I see that you look a little, you know, a little bit bored out at the front desk with the shadowing. Do you feel like you're ready to jump in and have somebody shadow you so that, you know, if you have questions, they're there. Um, if If they seem nervous when they're shadowing, hey, do you need some more time with the shadowing? Do you want to reread any parts of the manual do you do you want a buddy for the first couple of shifts or maybe the first two weeks of working here is there somebody that you feel comfortable with um i think the the best way to train that is to train yourself to to recognize people's communication skills which is kind of an awkward way to put that but if if you're seeing something in somebody that might be working for them but not for somebody else i think that's where the training needs to come from okay this person uh, really really took to the videos are there other videos that we can have them watch um are there videos on youtube about doing a reference uh, a reference interview that they can watch and then practice mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and a lot of it, i think is is you you learn by experience as a supervisor and, and watching all your different staff and seeing how they are doing things. Sometimes, like you said, ask them what they prefer. They might not know. Um, I know some people don't know. I don't know what my learning style is. What does that even mean? Okay, let's let's just try some things out or be a little more casual about it. Oh, you like watching videos and you catch that rather than reading a book, reading a manual. That's what we mean. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so I want you to know what would you recommend? What would you recommend for a person who is flexible without appearing to be a pushover? I think that goes back to the setting the boundaries. I, you know, like I, when I was introducing things, I tend to be very flexible. I don't have tons and tons of outside obligations besides my dogs. So um, if you are willing to be flexible, but you don't want to be the only person that gets asked for flexibility, I think it's, it, you know, it's don't automatically say yes. Um, okay, a great example, I have a Saturday person when that Saturday person needs time off, I am generally the first person they ask just because I'm the main supervisor. Uh, let me think about it, I need to check my schedule. Um, okay, maybe I don't have anything going on that Saturday, but maybe I wanna leave it open. I'm really sorry, but this, is, this isn't this is something that's gonna work for me. You'll need to check with some other supervisors. I think being flexible and being able to say yes, but also letting people know that your life is not your job and that you do have outside things is, is appropriate. Yeah. Yeah, and that's something you have to practice, I think too. It can be yes. hard, something you're always, 
the, you know, they're always saying, oh, yes, 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 of course, I'll do that for you. Or, and, and with your users too, your patrons, your students, you can't give them, you know, oh, sure, we'll, we'll waive everything. We'll let you get away with everything. No, there's got to be some little, you know, yes, but no. <laughs> um, and I think you mentioned about being in something that I think a lot of people, especially now in this days of being connected all, all the time, supposedly, there is a point where your work day is over and that's okay. Mm -hmm no one should come back at you and say you know i needed something at nine o'clock last night and you didn't answer you know it's nine o'clock last night at night and i'm not on i'm not working then yes <laughs> I'll and the yeah and that's perfectly okay and i'm from both sides yeah. that you need that kind of um acceptance on both sides that that's, at this point that's something that can really work into flexibility as well um if you're somebody that that can say yes and you like to say yes it's also okay for you to say, here's the deal. I'm a night owl. If you want me to cover your shift from, uh, you know, six to 10, ask me first, because I'm probably going to say yes, but I'm just not a morning person. If you need somebody to cover an eight to noon, I'm not the best choice. Yep. And You're flexible this way, but not so much this way. Yep. And when you have a lot enough staff to go around, you can you know, adjust those people appropriately and say, okay, who's, who likes to be up in the morning? Who doesn't? Mm -hmm. I was that person at the university I worked at too. We had um, evening reference staff would come in at like six o'clock at six to whatever. And I was the person whose schedule was just bumped a couple hours. So I would work like 10 to six so that there would be a librarian on duty until the evening people came in. And that was the same thing. I didn't have anything else going on. There was nobody at home waiting for me at that point, except for my cats. <laughs> so, um, it, and, um, Oh, good. I could. I was, and I was happy to do that. And everyone else was like, "Great! I don't want to have to stay here and not get my dinner yet." Or whatever. It's like, "All right, I will. I do. <laughs> I'm fine." Yeah. All right. Um, it's just hit eleven o'clock Central Time by my clock here, so that's perfect timing here. Uh, does anybody have any last-minute desperate questions they want to ask of Lacey in the question section? We'll get them answered. Um, you will have the slides available, as she said, her contact info. University of Nebraska at Omaha. <laughs> you can find her from there. Um, I'm going to pull presenter control back to my screen while we're waiting to see if anyone else has any questions. I'll show you here. I did look up that book that you mentioned, um, The Sociopath Next Door, mm -hmm. Martha Stout, and she did actually do a couple of other ones that I found. I just I looked in WorldCat, and the first one that came up was this one, Outsmarting the Sociopath Next Door in 2020. That's, yeah, a lot more. Yeah. Recent. Then there was also one in 20, where'd it go, where'd it go? 2016, Disarming the Sociopath Next Door. So she did do some expanding on her original book. Uh, so probably any one of these would be good to look into. Yes. Yeah. Um, the disarming is, the disarming might actually be a, better choice because I think that can be a little bit more difficult than the outsmarting I do. She talks about it in the first book. I do think um, it's it's definitely possible to outsmart a sociopath. <laughs> um, <laughs> they really hate it when you do. So that's, that's some motivation. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah. All right. And here I just I don't know which libraries have it, but I just, you know, all these are somewhere in WorldCat. So go ahead and look for them there. All right, what do we have going over here? Okay. Oh, and someone is also suggesting another book, uh, Surrounded by Sociopaths. Ooh, okay. By, and they can't remember the author right now. <laughs> um, let's see if I can find it in here. Uh, not finding anything. Oh. Ah, Thomas Erickson. Cool. All right. Let's see if this works. Yeah, I probably should have done this by author. Surrounded by idiots. Is that what we're looking for? 
Oh, surrounded by psychopaths. Oh, that's Ooh, okay. Surrounded by bad bosses. There's a whole bunch of things. Okay. Uh. <laughs> oh, sorry. You're just typing something else here, too. Okay. Oh, so I'm a psychopath. How to stop being exploited by others. Mm. Mm -hmm. There you go. I finally found it. <laughs> um, I follow a really great blog as well. Um, author is Haba Youssef. It's called I Hate It Here, <laughs> which is a fabulous title. And that's originally what caught my attention. But it, she's an HR CEO at a, I can't remember what company, but yeah. I hate it here. Um, H e b b a Haba Yusef. Yup. <laughs> That's the top um, one right here. Yup. Some really really great things come up in there. I mean, it is really HR focused. It's not necessarily a library blog, but there's been some things that I've picked up, especially concerning like how to combat burnout, which is something that everybody can find helpful. And I think that combating burnout is definitely part of empathy and knowing well, like you said at the beginning customer service is uh it's something that lots of um professions have to have mm -hmm. um, customer service skills soft skills and libraries being one of them yeah definitely so yeah that's that's a fun one <laughs> all right i'll have to follow that yeah all right, so it doesn't look like there's any other desperate questions right now. That's fine. You can, as I said, of course, reach out to um, Lacey at UNO whenever you do want to ask or just, or just chat with her about any of this. Um, so thank you so much, Lacey. This was really great. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure we've all, hopefully we've all learned a lot of new skills to use in our libraries and in the rest of our life. Um, try and, you know, practice these things a little more and get better at them. Practice will make it easier and less less stressful for everyone on both sides, I think. <laughs> yes. Absolutely, all right. All right, so thank you everyone. Thank you, Lacey. Um, this thank is our, you. Of, yeah, it was great having you here today. Um, as I said, um, the show is recorded, being recorded, and it goes to our archives. Um, if you use your search engine of choice, you, whatever you do, and you type in N Compass Live, the name of our show, you'll find our main page or our recording page. And I'm just going to click over to the recording page here. Uh, today's show will be posted here at the top of the list. Should be here by the end of the day tomorrow um, at the latest, as long as GoToWebinar and YouTube cooperate with me. Uh, everyone who attended today's show and registered for today's show will get an email from me letting you know when it's available. I know not everybody who registers is able to come on the day of. I know not everybody who registered was here today, <laughs> um, but yeah, I'll let you all know. And there will be a link, um, let's see, the one from last week. Yeah, there'll be a link just like this one to the recording on our YouTube channel and to the slides that we'll have um, available as well. While we're here on our, our show archives, I'll show you there is a search feature. So if you want to see if we've done a show on any particular topic, you can run a search here and see if um, the recording is here. Um, and I'll give you a warning here too. I'm going to scroll down a bit, not all the way, because if you notice, this is a long, long page. Uh, we have our full show archives here going back to when Encompass Live first premiered, which was in January 2009. So what that we're going on like 15 years of shows. Yes. <laughs> and we have all of our shows on our YouTube channel. So uh, just do pay attention if you do watch any of our old shows. Um, the original broadcast date is here. Um, some of the shows will be fine to watch, stand the test of time, still be good, useful information, but some things will become old or outdated. Um, services or resources may have changed drastically. Links might be broken. Uh, stuff, link, um, resources or services might not exist anymore. People might work at a different library than where they did when they pre presented for us 10 years ago. So just pay attention to that date when you do watch any of these. Um, but this is something libraries and librarians do. We keep things for historical purposes. So um, as long as we have a place to host all of our shows, which we do right now on our YouTube channel, we will always keep them available here. Uh, all right. And we've got lots of thank yous coming in. Thank you very much from Nashville, Tennessee, Public Library. Woo! Hello, Nashville. <laughs> uh, and thank you, everyone else, for being with us here today. Um, 
And this is our main page. Um, as you can see, we just got one show up here right now coming up. We're going to get some more into the schedule. I've got some people in conversation with me now about what we're going to have coming up. So keep your eyes on our page. Um, we also have a Facebook page that we do post things, um, keep up uh, for the show. So if you want to give us a like over the here, here if you'd like to use Facebook, we do reminders. It's a reminder to log in today's show. We do a little meet the speaker. And then when our recordings are available, we do announce that on here as well. Whenever shows are added to the schedule, we announce it on here. Uh, so um, if you like to get, use um, YouTube, if you like to use Facebook, give us a like, or NCUMP Live is the hashtag. We use that on Twitter and Instagram as well from the Library Commission um, and from my own personal accounts. So uh, you can um, keep an eye on things there. So I think that'll wrap up for today. Thank you everybody for being here with us today. And hopefully, um, thank you, Lacey, it was good to see you and good to have you on the show. Thank you. And uh, hopefully we'll see you all on a future episode of Encompass Live. Bye-bye. <laughs>